Now, Professor, Professor Serba is going to talk for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and you can then ask questions, and we ask you to put those questions in the chat, and I can then pose them to Professor Serba. Okay. Professor Serber was a visiting fellow at Lucy Cavendish for six months in 2018, and she has been an associate to Lucy Cavendish since. Norwegian by birth, she is taught English literature at Volda University College in Norway for over 30 years. She holds a PhD from the University of Oslo and has published two monographs about Jane Austen. Professor Serber has been a partner in several EU funded projects and networks about women writers of the past. This year, she has published her own translation of Austen's Northanger Abbey into Norwegian. And she's going to talk a bit about translating um, Jane Austen's work in Norwegian now. Over to you, Professor Austen. Um, Professor Serber, I mean. That was a very beautiful slip of the tongue, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Henrietta, and for your introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I look forward to hearing your comments and questions afterwards. Now, I hope you can see my screen, my PowerPoint, the, the title page. Uh, what a privilege it is to have a chance to talk about Jane Austen's work and afterlife. Uh, and let me start by showing you Jane Austen sitting in a Norwegian mountainside overlooking the fjords and towns where I live. It's the cover of my book on Austin in Norwegian, serving as examples of the challenges of translation in general. The picture is, of course, a symbol of Austin transferred, received, refashioned for new times and places. And I've been interested in Austen's novels for a very long time, and here are the covers of my two books about her reception, as well as three books I have been very happy to contribute chapters to, and uh, not least that I excellent series, The Reception of British and Irish Authors in Europe. Now, my long-standing interest in Austen was renewed by the many television and film adaptations since the 1990s. They have reminded me that the screen version can never reproduce a book. It will always be one of an endless possibility of interpretations of that book. Furthermore, film is a visual work of art using its own means and techniques to tell a story similar to the novel, but never the same. I always find it most rewarding to compare books with their screen interpretations to try to understand why some parts are, of a novel are omitted, others included, why indeed some elements are added in films. And my book, Irony and, Id uh, Irony and Idyll, which is an attempted Austenesque title, um, you may tell, uh, discusses seven film versions of two novels. Now, my other main field of research has been into translation as reception of a literary work. And I inevitably discovered that again, similarly to film, this is not a straightforward process. And sometimes translations deviate significantly from original works. They are always interpretations with a style that will bear witness to the time, place and circumstance of the translation. Translators and filmmakers are, of course, readers of the text they work on. And as readers, we all come to the text with our own preconceptions, perspectives and contexts. And from a hermeneutic perspective, that is a, a, to the perspective of interpretation, Jane Austen's novels evidently invite a rich variety of responses from readers, translators and filmmakers. It is an intriguing exercise to study and compare them, although we only have time for a very few examples here today. This will be a quick taste rather than a full meal. And many more entertaining specimens, I hope, are to be found in my books and, and articles. And here, very, very quickly, uh, my three most recent articles and chapters in this field. 
challenges of translating Austen. Austen and Shakespeare translated, both authors compared, and interpretations of Jane Austen's irony on screen and in translations. Now, a very quick glance at the woman herself and her titles, just to remind ourselves of her lifespan and her work, as I'm sure that it's not necessary for most of you, but still. Jane Austen's books in Norwegian translation, um, in addition to studying other people's translations of Jane Austen, I have also tried my hand at translating her myself. Uh, uh, mine is at the bottom of this, uh, or bottom right hand corner of this table of translations from 1871 until now. Um, uh, the, mine is the 13th Austin title translated into Norwegian uh, out this year. And actually the first time Northanger Abbey has been translated into Norwegian. It appeared in this very beautiful series. I just have to show you that very quickly again. Um, because it's so beautiful, like a series of classics uh, of, by, you know, by different authors collected. So Northanger Abbey takes its place in that series. Um, and uh, when writing Jane Austen Speaks Norwegian that I showed you earlier, I attempted to calculate how many translations that have been globally which is an impossible task, but I, I, I concluded that there must have been more than 680. That's a very modest figure and much more research by many people needs to be done in different languages in different countries to, to be able to compare Austin's work in translation. And I'm very I'm curious to see what this burgeoning field of, of research uh, will turn up in the future. Now, what are the tools of Austen's irony first? We don't have much time to discuss them, but I just wanted to show them, or, or some of them anyway, a selection. Uh, because irony is often perceived to be an inherent quality of Austen's work and attitude, but is it translatable and is it relatable for modern audiences? That was my main question today. And in her novels, it is it, irony sometimes appears in narrative comments, uh, and they are very striking when they appear, and not always appreciated by translators, and certainly not by most filmmakers, although there are a couple of interesting examples or exceptions that I'm, I will come back to. Um, but even more so, her irony rests in subtler narrative techniques like free, indir free indirect speech, light motifs, dramatic irony at the expense of characters, perhaps, and perhaps the form of irony most frequently noticed and appreciated by readers and audiences, is the use of ironic voices among the characters, or at least Elizabeth Bennet and her father in Pride and Prejudice. And here I will have to limit myself to only a, to, to only a few of these. What, what are the targets then of Jane Austen's irony. Um, from, the, from the early years of reception, uh, from the early 19th century, critics and scholars have commented on Austen's wit or humour or irony. Uh, uh, and, and each of her novels is infused with a narrative tone that is coolly ironical, I would say, always displaying her character's weaknesses and ridiculousness, even, even the best of them. Um, her novels provide a gallery of what her brother Henry, in his biographical notice, called, I quote, frailties, foibles and follies. Uh, she, she presents clowns making fools of themselves, such as Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice. She satirizes snobs, such as Mrs. Elton and Emma. And here I'd like you to, to, uh, to consider, do her novels always revere parental and other authorities? Are they in awe of titled ladies, grand estates and trappings of wealth? Or do they satirize them? Is female education seen as adequate? Are the lovers always celebrated or are they sometimes mocked or perhaps both at the same time? 
these questions I will leave hanging, I think. Here, uh, here a reminder of the ensuing question, how are these ironical targets treated in films, in film reception? Um, so I will leave that one also hanging. I, I, think, I think this slide will remind you of some examples. Now, back to translations and irony in translations. Uh, um, a few selected examples or illustrations of the dilemmas. <clears throat> and I'm starting with the, the idea that some concepts in, in any language will be seemingly untranslatable. You know, it's difficult to find an adequate translation in, in the target language. For instance, um, what is an accomplished woman, which is a, a, a core term in Pride and Prejudice and, uh, and other novels as well, particularly, the, particularly in Pride and Prejudice. What is an accomplished woman? And how should that word, that adjective be translated? In actual fact, the Norwegian translations that I've studied altogether have, have employed 14 different words or expressions to translate that one adjective. And I've now, in all these examples, back translated them into English just to show you, you know, <laughs> how this works. Um, so accomplished is translated as good at, everything they must know, gifted, talented, qualifications, skills, virtues, proficient, cultivated, and the noun accomplishments is translated as developments, interests, studies, immerse yourself in books, cultural pursuits. You can see in some of them that there's, there's some sense to it, and there are many possible translations. But the, some of the point here is that translators tend to uh, vary between different solutions and, and use an array of different synonyms rather than sticking to one concept. And so you lose the ironic, this effect of an ironic concept in translation. And that's very, that very often happens. Another, my second example from translation um, uh, is ironic repetition. Austin employs repetition for ironic effect. Uh, my example is from Sanditon, the draft. Um, where Mr. Parker tries to convince the Haywood family to come to his new seaside resort. He argues that they need to spend six weeks of every year with sea air and sea bathing because taken together, they are anti-spasmodic, anti-pulmonary, anti-septic, anti-bilious and anti-rheumatic. And obviously this is a very comical list of anti-words. Now the recent uh, Norwegian translation, very recent, has opted to translate the medical factual implications of the words. They cured cramps, pulmonary complaints, infections, gallstone and rheumatism. He has understood everything, but he's, he's not mimicked or echoed the anti, list of anti-words. And that's where the, uh, the um, irony uh, lies to, to a large extent here, it's a verbal irony. And it becomes even stronger. I mean, if you think that Jane Austen wrote this um, devastating irony on hypochondria uh, when she herself was uh, in the last half year of her life, you know, uh, terminally ill. Uh, so even when facing real illness, it appears that Austen couldn't help but laugh at it. Irony seems indeed to be an inherent quality of her nature as well as her work. My next example from translations, ironic jokes, and I've chosen this one and I've, I don't think I've seen others comment on it before, but I find it striking. Um, obviously, humour is, is, as, is as much part of Austen's nature as is irony. They are inseparable, I think, in her nature. But it's challenging for translators. Humour is challenging. Jokes are, are challenging. and. Here, Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice must secretly be considering her options among the available, more or less elig eligible bachelors, when Colonel Fitzwilliam seems to be warning her off. He is the youngest son of an earl, and he must marry money, he finds. Now, Elizabeth, of course, has no money, and she takes the embarrassing hint, and she resorts to a joke. And the joke is, 
and pray. What is the usual price of an elf's younger son? Unless the elder brother is very sickly, I suppose you wouldn't ask about about fifty thousand pounds. And the joke about buying marriage candidates and sorting them into price categories according to future prospects is, of course, a humorous exaggeration, but it's still uncomfortably near to the truth or to some to some truth that is also being ironically revealed here. The ironic significance is not caught in this Norwegian translation, which is very bad, actually. And what does the younger son need then? Unless the elder brother is very sickly, he cannot very, very well be content with less than £50,000. Now, this translator has not understood at all the point and, and who wants the pounds or anything. So the sentence becomes pointless. My next example from translation, the ironic, the devil is in the detail, or the ironic devil in this case. Now, often the author's irony rests in seemingly innocuous words and fine drawn twists of phrasing. And so any translator needs to lend an ear to the subtle tones of words and phrases that often constitute Austin's irony. They might pass for a happy couple, she says about the young Musgraves in Persuasion. And this is often translated as if they were a happy couple. Uh, they must on the whole be called a happy couple. They were apparently a they were apparently a satisfied couple. They're sort of attempting modifications, but not the same as Austin might pass for. It sounds very, very skeptical. Um, um, and reminds us of uh, there's a distinct difference between um, surface and, and, and truth, uh, reality. Now, this phrasing of might pass for a happy, happy couple reminded me of uh, another Austin peculiar modification of prescribed happiness in Mansfield Park, at the end of Mansfield Park. Um, uh, uh, which is perhaps taken at face value often. The happiness of the married cousins must appear as secure as earthly happiness can be. Thoroughly perfect in her eyes, Austin says, as secure as, perfect in her eyes, not perfect, as a big difference. Now, and this, I will just, just um, go very quickly over this to show you very quickly this slide of pride and prejudice and irony on parents, parental authorities, uh, because in pride and prejudice, Mr. Bennett is described as irresponsible and indolent, and he tends to criticize his wife rather a lot. In all, is, are, Austin, are Austin films perhaps hesitant to, um, to include this perhaps harsh um, view of the Bennett parents? I'll leave that question hanging in the air as well. Showing you here three different versions of Mansfield Park, uh, very different, extremely different, one ironical, one traditional, and one sentimental. But I will, I will comment on one of them now in, 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 in the following few minutes. <clears throat> um, because this is an example also from, from film, that film ironies can replace narrative ironies in novel. And I, we have two interesting examples of filmmakers finding filmic means to create the same tone of ironic distance as Austen does in her novels. It's the very new persuasion and then the 1999 Mansfield Park. And I think that both of these novels are much more ironic than they often assumed to be in criticism and scholarship. The ending of Mansfield Park is an un ironic undermining of tra traditional romance patterns. It is an undermining of class distinctions. It is an undermining of the patriarchy. And I can explain this if I, if I had more time. Persuasion is a novel that satirizes upper class morals and lifestyles through giving us a degenerate, almost the last specimen of the race and whom we see literally replaced in his estate and his descendants. Um, by the middle and professional classes. So the nobility is mocked and men of the navy are celebrated in persuasion and the heroine Anne 
is closest to this authorial perspective. perspective. She could have been the future Lady Elliot, but she chooses a mere captain. So both these novels are written by an acutely class aware and class critical author, I would say. Now, and these two film directors, Carrie Cracknell and Patricia, Patricia Rosamer, have taken these, some of these ironical implications on board, particularly these class and, uh, and fem, fem, feminist implications on board. And, and uh, employed the technique of direct or intrusive commentary in the mouth of the protagonist. So she's talking to us, and both of these heroines are. They don't do that in the novel, but in the films use this, they sort of, they sort of um, change some aspects of the novels to echo other aspects such, such as irony, humor, satire, perhaps criticism. Perhaps it feels unusual, unusual for many viewers to have the heroine com com communicating with us uh, directly. But it's an ancient technique. It 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 um, goes back to Greek drama. So it's been around for a long time. It's just been out of fashion in in periods of realism. I hope to see more directors in the future um, find experimental techniques to echo Jane Austen's uh, narrative irony. Uh, the, I will not read this, but you probably know this if you know Austen at all. This quote about her not being able to sit down and write a series romance, you know, if her, if her life were threatened by it. And oh, indeed, she always writes comedy, comedy or comical fiction. Um, she rarely celebrates anything. She almost always ridicules or at, at least is laughing up her sleeve. And the oddest thing I see is when is when Austen is quoted for words of wisdom, often lines taken out of context and misapplied, like, you know, the famous bank out of, re of recent years, the quote, I declare, after all, there is no such enjoyment as reading, which in Austen is a satirical dismissal of hypocrisy, while on the bank note, it becomes a celebration of reading, you know, turn, turned on its head. Um, so in these instances, Austen is made into a prophet and it's a role that suits her as little as the romancer. Uh, she wants to be a court jester. She wants to point to the weaknesses we may not want to admit to. It annoys me greatly to see Jane Austen described as a naive defender of existing class structures or of idyllic life in English country houses. Here the films have done her somewhat of a disservice making us associate her stories with glitter and glamour and balls and gowns and cakes and curtains and all these are things we hardly see anything of in the box and never without an ironic dismissal of sickening wealth and assumed su superiority. Orson herself was the poor relative who hardly owned anything in her own right before the last years and she shows in her stories how being born to struggle makes for better persons than being born to privilege. And to conclude, in studying translations as well as a number of screen adaptations, I have thus found that although Jane Austen's irony can be challenging to handle and sometimes lost or obscured or even unwanted in reception, there are still intriguing attempts to relate to her work by modern filmmakers and audiences and ongoing efforts to translate her irony for modern readers. Certainly her relevance has not dated, although always finding new expressions, I would say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Marie. That was a really interesting um, sort of whistle-stop tour through different bits of irony in Jane Austen's work and the way in which it's been treated or maybe not treated, as you would probably argue, but really interesting. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions and um, I've seen that at least one question has come in from Randy. Um, and so um, they say, can you 
describe translating the many satirical speeches of Henry Tilney in your own translation? And do you think your study of these issues aided your own translation process? I think that's an excellent question. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, that that was that was a pure pleasure to translate Henry Tilney's. Um, uh, he he's he's one of the ironical voices of Austen's uh, um, works, and uh, and he um, and he. Um, I, yes, I, I think it 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 sort of made me war more aware more awake or more uh, i don't know um uh, attempting to be um to to, re to render jen austen's uh, text exactly as she uh, ho as i think she intended it or as she, she she meant it at the time um uh because it is um because i've seen so, so, so many versions of you know of 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 it of her text being twisted. Now, um, Henry Tilney is, is, um, is uh, an ironical voice, but even perhaps even more interesting, I don't know whether the, whether the questioner is, is, agrees, but uh, perhaps even more interesting, interesting as for, as for uh, commentaries in North Angarabia are obviously the author's own comments as well, which are striking in North Angarabia. And which are, you know, she has a long passage on, um, on, uh, on, the, on defending the novel as a genre because it was attacked by so many men, particularly at the time. And Henry Tilney is one of those, uh, one of the few men who who uh, admits to reading novels <laughs> because okay. you know they were they were sort of considered to be um, female reading matter, you know. Uh, sentimental, gothic, obviously, um, entertainment stories. They weren't, you know, the serious realistic novel hadn't appeared on the market. And I think that Jane Austen is a foremother for that. But uh, but she um, she defends the novel and, and partly in Henry Tilney's attitude to the novel, Henry Tilney as a reader, and partly in her own direct defense of the novel in plain words in, in, in the text of the novel. That was a very long answer and sort of a bit me meandering, I think, but <laughs> that's absolutely all right. OK, so we don't have um, much time for and there's lots of questions, actually. So I'm just going to pick one. Um, so there's a question here that says, um, are there any Norwegian authors who use a similar ironic voice? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, um, yes. The, I, I think you. I think you will find. I mean, uh, irony is. Uh, I, supp I suppose irony is popular at all at all times and in all in all cultures. As a sort of a personal preference difference, you know, some authors prefer irony, satire, uh, the distance, the jokes, and other authors prefer the sentimental and the genuine and the, the the deep feelings and so on and you have both kinds in no, among norwegian authors as well um and uh, and uh, i don't know how how familiar um this, the the the, the uh, oscar is is uh, with norwegian authorships but uh, uh yeah i th i think what would be interesting of course is to see if that gets lost in translation as well when it's translated into other languages or how that would work but oh yeah 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 i think i think it's the same challenge translation is the same challenge whatever is whatever the target and source languages are uh, mm. uh i that that's my impression from my you know very limited obviously study um but i but i i, I think that uh, I think that on the one hand, it's it is, uh, uh, or some people would say that translation is impossible because you know the languages are incompatible, and you know at least a hundred percent you can't a hundred percent have one language correspond to the to another. 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that even so, I mean, think that that's very true. But even so, you know, even in spite of the difficulties and, and the and the and the shortcuts and the sometimes, um, you know, you have you know you have to make some choices and so on. But even in spite of that, I think the fundamental correspondences between languages, it seems, uh, that that makes it that it makes translation possible and even rewarding and even sensible. Uh, activity to do for, for to transmit authorships and and I'm I'm glad to say that that is my experience because otherwise we would lose out on a lot even I mean even English even native speakers of English would lose out on a lot of world literature if mm -hmm. if there were no mm -hmm. translations you know so it's not only the small languages the minor languages that need translation it's also the major languages you need translations from the smaller languages often you know or between the major languages yeah absolutely yeah mm -hmm. okay i think we've run out of time um there's been a lot of thank yous for your really interesting talk um so i think um thank you also to everyone who joined us to listen and um um we'll be back um and marie thanks once again for a really inspiring talk everyone have a nice evening Thank you.